Thank you, Oscar. I'm Bill Alcoholic. Hey, Bill. I was um, I don't know what to say. Uh, you know, <laughs> I got a half an hour, right? Yep. All right. So let's go. Uh, I uh, drank like a pig. I know I, I hit it off right off the bat. I think when I was, uh, well, my dad died when I was 15. And when I was 14 on New Year's Eve, I got uh, really drunk. I can remember him carrying me out. Uh, it was a family um, New Year's Eve party out in Bothell, and uh, I was drinking screwdrivers. And uh, my cousin, who was serving that night, he said, "You know," he said, "I ended up giving you a whole glass full of straight vodka." He said, "You drank it like it was water." And uh, so, for the next year, I gagged every time I smelled. Uh, Orange juice, but I drank vodka till the day I quit drinking. You know, it was just um, something we just hit it off. You know, so it was uh, um, one week out of high school. I got my first DUI. I was in uh, was, uh, Redwood City, California. You know, it was it was a nice Friday night to get arrested. They'd had a Hell's Angel funeral down there, and and so there was about twelve of them inside this holding cell, and they me in there, you know, I was five foot eight and 130 pounds, and I was just out of place, you know. That's not where I was supposed to be, but, um, you know, um, and I also had, had had marijuana. I had a possession of marijuana. I, I got an attorney, and he dropped that charge, but, um, you know, I tell you is, down there I had a fake ID. And I would go to the liquor store, they'd get um, Red Mountain Vin Rose for a dollar and 51 cents a gallon. <laughs> now I had all these friends would buy a $10 bag of pot and be gone on the weekend. For $10, I could get six gallons of wine and I'd have plenty at the end of the week. <laughs> and, uh, there was no use, you know, why would I go after the other stuff, you know, because I'm an alcoholic, you know. I, I tried all the other party favors, but uh, you know everything I did. You all, well, it never dawned on me, but all the trouble I ever got in was alcohol related. You know, either going to or coming from something. You know, and uh, but it was, you know, my life was. Um, I thought I was doing just fine, hadn't accomplished anything, but I was having fun doing it. You know, but I was going to read a, this book I have is a, a second edition, and I don't know if any of you remember Nick Carr, Nick C. He passed away about eight or nine years ago. Uh, anyway, he got this second edition book from his wife, or his ex-wife. They both got sober November 11th, uh, 1970. And when she passed away, her son gave it to, to Nick, and then Nick gave it to me. And... Uh, I would, I'm going to read a, a part of it out of uh, working with others. It says, so the minute we put our worker on a service plan, the alcoholic commences to re rely upon assistance rather than God. He clamors for this or that, claiming he cannot master alcohol until the material needs are cared for. Nonsense. Some of us have taken very hard knocks to learn this truth. Job or no job, wife or no wife, we simply do not stop drinking so long as we, replay, as, so long as we place dependence upon other people ahead of a dependence upon God. And uh, so then I'm going to do this. You know, I, well, I had, well, I have, got pulled out. I got uh, drunk driving five different times. I was, uh, uh, drank my way out of, I was one quarter short of a college degree. Well, I got my degree in computers and then I was going for a degree in accounting. And, uh, but I got hired by Olivetti Corporation to program computers, put accounting systems into computers. And I was a head guy for a five state area out in the Midwest. And um, six months into it, my boss called me and he says, you're, he says, you got two weeks to finish your work and then you're, you're, you're fired. And uh, I said, why is that? And he said, well, you know, 
He says, you didn't tell us about that DU guy you got the first week after you got hired here. You lost your license for 60 days. We gave you a company car and you've been driving around five states without a driver's license. You know, one of our clients called, said you showed up on a Saturday drunk, you know, and, uh, oh, <laughs> maybe there's a reason, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, 1988, I went to, um, I went to a treatment center, Northwest Treatment Center, and um, it, uh, I didn't like it. You know, I thought it was a complete waste of time. But I didn't drink for another year and a half after that. I made it successfully with white knuckles. I mean, bruised knuckles. Made it a year and a half. And, and uh, you know, I, I was down in Renton working on a house. That's where I've been. I worked my way out of being able to do jobs. I, I was, became unemployable because of my alcoholism. And uh, so I started working on my own and I'd get, people would hire me for a few days and I would finish the short jobs and I'd go out on a drunk again. And in the meantime, you know, I've got a wife and two kids have accumulated by this time. And um, so anyway, I go to the treatment center and, and uh, a year and a half later, I was down in Renton and I, I, gave, I was talking to this guy in his garage. His wife came out and had him a beer and me a beer. And I looked at that beer and I thought, well, I don't drink. But I didn't say anything. I just alone. So I said, I got to go out to my truck. I went out to my truck and I just dumped the beer out and whew, made it through that one, you know. And then uh, later on that afternoon, he and I were talking again. His wife came in, handed him a beer and handed me a beer because I hadn't told him I didn't drink. And I started drinking that beer like I'd never stopped. And it, it tasted good, you know. Um, I remember the uh, Rainier Stubby, you know. And uh, so 15 minutes after I finished that beer, I said, well, I got to go get a part up at the hardware store. I went to the hardware store. We up at uh, Renton Highlands, which was right next to the liquor store. So I got me a, my pint of 100 proof Smirnoff and went in a Safeway, got a six pack of Budweiser 16 ounces because those two combina combinations is my, my favorite drink. And uh, went back down to that guy's house, finished that job, and I was off and, off and running, you know, and it was it was just that way. I, was, I didn't know that... Uh, well, I knew I was thirsty. You know, I had been tired of fighting it. It was just, it was, I was tired of fighting it. And uh, so a few years ago, we were out in St. Louis at my oldest daughter's house. And, and my wife and my daughter were talking. And I overheard their conversation. She says, yeah, I remember the last time dad was out drinking. That uh, when he started drinking. And my wife goes, yeah, I'm glad he did because he was a real asshole. You know, and... Uh, because I was, you know, I hadn't, I didn't have a solution. You know, I was stark raving, not sober. I was just not drinking. You know, so, um, but before I got to that, that place, my, uh, the DUI that I'd got fired, part of the firing package, um, I had to go to uh, uh, AA meetings in uh, Deadwood, South Dakota. I went to this one meeting and the guy goes, well, he says, I'm the only one here, obviously. He said, but we have an agreement with the judge that I have to write a report about your demeanor during this meeting. And he says, uh, if you don't like it, he says, you don't have to be here. And I didn't know where any other AA meetings were, but that one, I said, well, whatever. And then he told me a story about his drinking. He said, you know, he said that we lived in a ranch style home. And I woke up one morning and, and uh, I asked my wife, well, where's the car? And she said, well, look in the living room. <laughs> and, and he had driven, you know, there was a garage on one side and a bedroom on the other side and a living room in the middle. And he had missed the garage and the bedrooms and, and he was in a blackout. So he parked the car in the, in the living room and got out and went to bed. And uh, I thought, man, you know, I, I'll never get like that. I mean, that, that's a, that's a, that's pretty bad, you know. And then, uh, oh, not too long before I quit drinking, was able to stop finally. But uh, my wife says, uh, "You gonna fix that window?" I said, "What window?" She said, "The one you back the ladders through on your truck when you parked came in last night." I said, "Ah, oh, my truck had to been rolled on. The brakes must have been bad." She said, "Didn't roll uphill." I said, oh. <laughs> you know, that was uh, um, so I did what that guy did, right? 
got drunk, crashed the truck, and went to bed. So, you know, it, it, um, I just, I knew I started to have a problem. I had to go to those meetings, and then I didn't go to any meetings um, for many years after that. I, 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 the only job I could get, I went in the Army, thinking that I could uh, get something accomplished in there, and I mean, I'm glad it did. It gave me, I was in for six years, and for about four and a half years, I was a very good soldier, you know. Um, I realized that all the anger I had inside of me from growing up in a pretty alcoholic home was uh, worked well. It did what I wanted it to do, you know. They said, you go, you know, take this gun and climb this hill, and I run up that damn hill, you know. It was like, because I was just, I didn't know how much anger I had in me. I, I found that out after getting out that I was still, you know, was, I always said, you know, I think uh, uh, when the doctor slapped me when I was born, I slapped him back. You know, it's just, that's just the way I've always felt, you know, is don't threaten me because I'm, we're in a fight, you know, and uh, so it was uh, a hard road. When I finally was able to, um, cause I went, you know, towards the end, I was going to meetings and drinking. I, my wife would give me a, a buck and I wouldn't put it in a basket. I'd buy a quart of beer to ride home because I was thirsty, you know. And I remember about the last meeting I went to before I was able to actually get a sponsor was uh out in Linwood, I went to a meeting and I went to the store afterwards and bought me a quart of beer and the guy in front of me had been the secretary of that meeting. And I I felt bad, but it didn't keep me from drinking. But I got about half of that quart of beer down and I stopped at a red light and I just put that out on the street and drove off. You know, I was done. I was just absolutely done. And, uh, you know, so I... Asked the guy, went to a meeting at, actually at that Northwest Treatment Center that outside people bring the meetings. And I, this guy had been going there off and on and for a while. And I asked him, and, and we started this journey. I figure he saved my life. He went to drink, he started drinking again after about four months. He'd been sober for five years. He started drinking again. He's called me up. He says, Well, you got to get, get a new sponsor because I went out. And I said, All right. Well, so I went and got uh, another guy. I asked him, and and he said, okay, but we got to start all over again. Now, I was, I was right in that four step when my sponsor called me. He said, well, we got to start all over again. And I said, why? I said, he drank. I didn't, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, because he missed something. He says, you don't want to miss that same thing, you know. So I, you know, grudgingly started writing, you know. And uh, that was, uh, well, my last drink was somewhere before September 25th. 1990, you know, so it was, uh, I couldn't tell, I think it was in August, but um, my sponsor didn't ask me to remember the date until then. I just, I knew I was in treatment because I went to the 10 day spin dry thing they had and, and uh, gritted my teeth and made it through that, you know, but it was, it, Alcoholics Anonymous has saved my life. You know, the reason I read that part about uh, job or no job, wife or no wife is, because two years after, I, uh, two years and one week after I got sober, arsonists torched our house, and it uh, we lost everything. You know, we came out in the middle of the night. Uh, boy, I can remember, you know, it's like my wife. I, the first time in months, I'd gone to bed before midnight. You know, and, and uh, she, I hear you. She goes, Bill, and I go, what? She goes, Bill. I go, what? Jesus, you know, like, what the hell do you want in the middle of the night? She says, you got to come out here and look at this. I didn't know what she was talking about. So I got up and there's flames going across the top of the kitchen. And the big plate glass window had blown out. And uh, I grabbed the phone. I said, call 911. I went down to these downstairs in the basement. We had a bedroom with two of our kids down there. And um, so went down, got those two kids out of bed. And. My daughter at the time, she was, I don't know, 14, I think, uh, or 15. Anyway, she goes, I said, get up the stairs. She says, Dad, they're, they're on fire. And I said, get up those stairs. Because, like, I said, get out. You know, we're, we're leaving this house. And just one wall of the stairs, but they weren't, she didn't have to run through the fire. Just had to run next to it. We got upstairs, and the smoke was down to here. And uh, I tried standing up, and it's like putting my head in a blast furnace. I didn't know what fires are. But we came out of that and uh, 
I had a spiritual experience standing across the street from that, watching them with chainsaws, the fire department with chainsaws, cutting holes in the ceiling and, and through the roof to vent the fire out. And uh, I got, they asked me after the fire, you got anything else you want? And I said, I don't know what's left. And uh, so they gave me a pair of pants. We were all in pajamas and, and he gave me my, a pair of jeans that had my truck keys and wallet in it. And my wife's car had gone up in flames right next to the house. You know, all the furniture was gone, four bedroom house. And, uh, you know, I just, but I, across the street is, um, I don't know if you know what gossamer is. It's like the, the, the flimsiest film material that it, you see it floating in the air sometimes in movies and all that. I felt like that had been dropped down over me. I felt, I just knew, I absolutely knew that things were going to be all right. You know, I just knew it. And I turned to my wife and I said, you know, I said, uh, God's going to take care of us. And she said, I know. And I thought, you bitch. You know, <laughs> I had to do inventory. I've been having to go to all these meetings to get this spiritual experience. And you know, automatically, you know, it's like, how does that happen? You know, you know um, but so anyway, you know, I, I've thought about, there was a lot of people who were affected by this arsonist. He uh, was convicted of 127 fires. He admitted 77. Um, he's doing uh, four life sentences now, so he won't be getting out anytime soon. And uh, but if all the people that were affected by the fire, you know, I think I'm glad it happened to us because we became a closer fam knit family. You know, it did not scare us off. You know, it didn't make us resentful to each other. Somebody was at fault or all of that. You know, and I asked my, well, my sponsor says, you know, you can't have a resentment over that. I said, well, why can't, what do you mean I can't have a resentment over that, you know? I mean, like a guy burned our house, we lost everything, you know? And he says, because you didn't have a part in it. And I thought, damn. Okay. I've never had a resentment over it. If I, I didn't have a role to play, you know? Because uh, everything that happened afterwards happened just like it was supposed to, you know? Um, Insurance came along, all that kind of stuff, you know. I mean, people people were showing up left and right uh, to bring us stuff. We have still a kept a copy of it. Now, this was 30 years ago, um, October 7th. So we still have a list. There's three and a half pages of furniture that people had wanted to give us. Or they had, our church had said, uh, if you have clothes to donate, we'll collect them at the church. They collected three tables as long as these three tables here of clothes. And then the church ladies went through that and they took a whole bunch of clothes out. Like, well, this will fit these kids and they'll, you know, if they want them or not. And so uh, after they did that, we went up there and went through the clothes that we wanted. And I took uh, boxes that were 18 inches by 18 inches by two feet high. I took 22 boxes of those just to uh, St. Vincent de Paul of the clothes that we didn't have, you know, we didn't need. I mean, it was, people are calling a year later, do you need this, do you need that? But I can remember standing in the front yard the day after the fire and uh, or the two days after the, and uh, all these people just coming up and I want to give kids bicycles and, you know, all that stuff. I mean, it was unbelievable the stuff that was coming out. And, uh, I told my sponsor with all these people standing around going, uh, I said, I wish these people just leave us alone. Just, why don't they just go away and let us, you know? Because like, after all, I'm a self-made man, you know? I don't need anybody's help. And he said, well, he says, you have an obligation to receive as much as they feel I need to give. He says, when they give you something, you look them in the eye and you say, thank you. And I thought, oh, because I'd never said thank you. I'd always said, well, I don't need this. Oh, well, yeah, thanks anyway, but I'll pass it on or something, you know. I'd never admitted to uh, actually needing help, you know. And uh, those are pretty pretty strong words. I, I remember to this day. Uh, it was, and so anyway, that arson, that's enough of the arson. So at, at two years, I had arson. At three years, I was diagnosed with end-stage liver disease. Uh, at four years sober, uh, Somebody got in my garage and told all my tools that had got burned up in the fire. Uh, uh, six years, my mom died. 
my mom and I had never been on really close terms. She, you know, uh, um, after my dad died, I quit high school and I went to work actually down at Todd Shipyard over there. And, uh, you know, like about my age, back that time, they didn't care how old you were, you know, as long as you could pick up a wrench. And I was a pipe fitter's helper and made some pretty good money down there, you know, and, and my mom hadn't worked in 20 years. So I was giving her a lot of that paycheck and, and I, I had three little sisters. Um, and we were doing, we were doing well. And then after my mom got a job, she started getting into the bottle and uh, uh, one night she kicked me out and I was all right, I left. You know, I, um, she sent my brother after me a couple of days later. And, uh, but we had that sort of more of acquaintance than, than, uh, uh, parent kid relationship um, but you know after I got sober um, our relationship changed completely you know uh, we became we became friends and we weren't drinking buddies you know we were uh, actually friends and uh, so when I was six years sober she died and I was holding her hand when her spirit passed that was something because whenever everybody died usually I run I don't want to be around that you know when I was eight years sober, our nephew came to live with us because his mom was a drug addict and couldn't maintain a household or any of that. And uh, so the next year, well, that was that was in November. And then so the next February, his little sister, who is uh, eight months old, came to live with us because the oldest son, who was 15 at the time, he called one of my other nephews and he said, uh, we don't have anything to eat. We're even out of peanut butter. And uh, they were living in uh, Rainier Vista at the time, getting ready to get tossed out of Rainier Vista, which if you don't have any money, they don't toss you out. But they're going to toss her out. And um, the, so they wanted to know what to do with the little baby. And I said, well, uh, first I said, call call uh, child CPS. I, said, I'm, I go over there. That's not going to be good. You know, I'm going to skin my sister alive and uh, for that kind of stuff. And so they did. And then I was, I have been a Boy Scout leader for 30 years, 30 years, more than 30 years. Anyway, so I was coming home from Boy Scout meeting. And I had this police car sitting out in front of my house and I rolled down my window. I said, do you guys need some help? And the guy goes, you live here? And I go, yeah. He says, well, you see that officer in the back seat? See that little baby on his lap? He says, either she's staying here or she's going to... Uh, She's going to um, where they put uh, emergency uh, CPS kids, you know. And I said, well, bring her in the house. And that was my, I had seen her once in the backseat of the car when my sister had dropped her son off at our house. And uh, so we had uh, added two more kids to the house, you know, and, and uh, just wasn't worried about it, you know. I knew God was going to take care of us. We, were, we just had that going. So it was, um, we had to go to all the classes, how to be an adoptive parent, how to be a, a foster parent. We had to go to, you know, I mean, I thought we were bad man. There were some really bad cases in there. I, I, you know, I just, it was something else. So anyway, we had to go to court over uh, the children uh, because my sister wanted to get them back and the state wouldn't give them back. And so she got an attorney and they went through that. And, it was eight, no, yeah. We had eight court dates over 11 months and uh, they called me up as a witness and uh, her attorney goes, didn't you do drugs with your sister at one time? Didn't you do cocaine with your sister at one time? And I looked at him and I'm looking at my sister. I'm going, you know, like, it's your word against mine. I look at the judge and I look back at him and I say, well, yes, I did. And uh, then the state's attorney goes, Your Honor, how about if we just list this to the last 10 years? And the judge goes, That's okay. That's okay with me. And I went, Because I just hit 10 years in sober. So, like, I, you know, bring it on, man. <laughs> you know, from my past record, that's okay. So, you know, we, uh, um, that's, uh, so uh, my nephew lived with us for the next, for 14 years before he was able to. Get a job, get his stuff together. Now he's got a child and a, a girlfriend. They're living up in 
buying a, a house up in Everett, and you know, uh, the youngest one that she was eight months old, she was born uh, an addict. She had a grand mal seizure when she was three days old, um, and her brain is not like everybody else's brain. She can function, but it's you know, she, she had no idea what it's like to live a life sober, so she has nothing to compare it to. Like a lot of people that get into AA, you know, we've got a previous life and we've got other examples, but she didn't have that example, except what we were able to give her. So she's still, um, she smokes a lot of pot. I just saw her, I was down in August, down in California where she lives, down south of Los Angeles. Um, actually, she's able to live in the Guna Beach area and uh, I don't know how, but she did it. She's doing fine, you know. I, she, she works, she's got a group of friends, and those group of friends go from AA to NA to AA to NA to, you know, um, and they're staying, most of them are staying sober most of the time, you know. I don't think you can find one that's got a year between them, but there's five or six of them, and their whole idea is just, that's how they socialize, is at meetings. So that was, uh, yeah, the 11, the court dates with my sister. Uh, and my best friend, when I was 12 years sober, my best friend, my brother passed away from stomach cancer. Um, I was laying in bed with him when his spirit left. So uh, the next year after that, or two years after that, I had to have a liver transplant. Because that end-stage liver disease that had been gone, I'd quit drinking, quit drugging, and all that. And, and uh, But I had gone past the point of no return for my liver. So uh, I had that, and I haven't ever had a problem with that, I'll tell you, though, you know, was, I was talking to my sponsor one time, oh, now i got a new liver, you know, maybe I can go back to drinking again. <laughs> you know? It's like, it's a good liver. And uh, he said, Bill, he says, that was a liver transplant, not a brain transplant. You know? <laughs> so let's, let's go with that, you know, because remember your problem is in your brain, is in your mind, right? And so then uh, two years after that, my sister died of an overdose. And... Uh, the, the mother of the children, and, and uh, you know, it wasn't a surprise, you know, because there wasn't much we could do, you know. I mean, uh, she had come over to my house the week earlier, and I'd given her some money, and uh, I'd like to go, well, it was my fault, because she overdosed on the money, right? <laughs> you know, I, I'm not the addict. You know, I, I tried to give her some money so she could have it actually move into her own place, but she couldn't. So her her uh, possessions was uh, about a half a garbage bag full of clothes and some pictures. Oh, so, you know, um, and then my life seemed to calm down. I have not had any of that trauma for the last, you know, 15 years. It, it's, uh, uh, life is wonderful. I, my home group, uh, when I got sober, is uh, the solution group. It's at seven, eight o'clock at Ballard First Lutheran Church on Tuesday nights. Uh, still go there on Tuesday nights if you want to find me. That's where I'll be. Um, it's nothing for my kids. Well, now the kids have all grown up and moved out, but it was nothing for them to wake up, go well, to go to bed one night when I'm talking to an alcoholic at the, at the kitchen table, and wake up and they'll be talking to another, a different alcoholic in the morning. All they do is just elbow them over and start eating their cereal. You know. I was like, um, I just I told them, you can tell anybody your dad's an alcoholic, just tell him that he doesn't drink anymore. I said, but remember to tell him he doesn't drink anymore. <laughs> but, you know, so I've had a few of them kids' parents contact me about one of their spouses having a, a problem. You know, it's, you get in a crowd of sober people and somebody finds out that you're, uh, that you might be an alcoholic and doesn't drink anymore the stories start coming out from everybody else about how so-and-so does this or how so-and-so did that. And, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer for any one of them. I just can tell them what I did, you know, is I, I found a, I found an answer. I found a solution in alcoholism and us that worked for me. That's worked for a whole lot of other people, you know, and um, I truly, I, uh, AA is, 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 it saved my life. You know, they wouldn't let, they wouldn't have given me a, liver transplant, if I, well, I wouldn't have made it to, to the liver transplant if I was still doing what I was doing, you know, it was, uh, 
I don't know. Um, I, I had uh, alcoholic cirrhosis and hepatitis C, and and that uh, liver must have looked like a about a forty year old football when they took it out of me. You know, I mean, it was not it wasn't functioning at all. Uh, so, um, but in the meantime, you know, what do I what do I do to stay sober? Well, I go to meetings five or six or seven a week, eight. I don't know. It just depends on the week. You know, I know I need I need either whether I'm there to listen, to share, or to talk to somebody. I need three meetings a week, but I don't know which three meetings I need, so I go to five or six to make sure that I got it done. You know, and that's worked for me for the last 32 years. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be sober if it wasn't for Alcoholics Anonymous. And that includes each and every one of you. So thanks for listening to me.